Tonight, raging wildfires and relentless heat. No escape from a summer of extremes. Looks like nighttime in the day. Thousands on the run in Northwest Territories. The wind was very strong. New alerts as scorching temperatures bake the West. Anything extreme in this community can be for some life or death. Plus the rising death toll in Hawaii's disaster zone. Debating the side effects of the popular drug Ozempic. If it works for you, that's fantastic. Um, but there are risks. Complaints, the warnings don't go far enough. And an epic exercise in greatness. When you're good at it, you want to do it more. How this Montrealer became the fittest man on earth. CTV National News with Omar Sachadina. Good evening, everyone. The military is now on the ground in the Northwest Territories as a historic airlift is underway in some of the most remote communities in the country. And tonight, the capital city of Yellowknife declared a state of local emergency. Plane loads of evacuees have already fled Hay River, Fort Smith, and Jean Marie River. It's the largest emergency airlift ever in the territory. CTV's Joe Makishan now on the urgent threat and the flights to safety. Today, Hay River is a ghost town. Wildfires burning nearby were whipped into an inferno Sunday, an unprecedented 24 hours as high winds fanned the flames, pushing them 75 kilometers in one day, moving the fire up and over the main highway to Yellowknife. With roads cut off, the last evacuees were directed to the airport to board military planes. I was in the dark, like pitch black. And all I seen was red flame on both sides of the highway and rolling fire like a tornado. This was Mary Jane Martin's view after she cleared the fire zone. Photos on social media show other cars and trucks along the main highway destroyed. Officials say there are no reported deaths, no injuries, but some communities were directly hit by fire. It is with a heavy heart that I confirm that there's been extensive losses in Enterprise and structural losses reported in Paradise Gardens. The hamlet of Enterprise south of Hay River is home to just over 100 people. As we were leaving Enterprise, you could see where it started getting darker and darker and it looked like Armageddon. This is the territory's worst wildfire season on record. Today, there are 234 wildfires burning. Five communities are evacuated. A number of others are on evacuation alert. People that have been evacuated, people that are in the fire situations now, I can't imagine the sorrow and the anxiety that you're feeling right now. Towns in northern Alberta are taking in evacuees and the military is moving into the fire zone. 120 soldiers from Quebec will be on the ground Tuesday. Omar. All right, Jill, thank you. More than a dozen temperature records tumbled in British Columbia today. Some cities pushing past 40 degrees Celsius. The scorching weather is expected to last through the week. CTV's BC Bureau Chief Melanie Nagy on the new measures advocates are calling for to protect people from these punishing heat waves. In a province already plagued by drought, and hundreds of wildfires. People are now grappling with soaring temperatures as BC is hit with yet another sweltering heat wave. On the streets of Vancouver's downtown east side where there's little shade to escape the scorching sun, outreach worker Evan Reek is on high alert. Anything extreme in this community can be for some life or death. Water, cooling towel. With so many vulnerable, Reek and his team are working to help people stay cool and safe. Even not having shade for 12 hours in a day, you got the 30 degree sun hitting on you, just leads to so many weather related illnesses that really affect the individuals down here. Dozens of heat warnings have been issued for several regions with some areas topping out at 39 degrees. Expecting to see that heat continue to build uh, particularly across the southern half of the province. The hot weather combined with dry conditions are making the province's forests and brush more flammable. 
On Vancouver Island, the speed at which flames can move was on full display today. A fire that appeared to start in an abandoned vehicle took seconds to spread. We had a fast-growing fire, but the crews uh, responded quickly and knocked down uh, the fire, and we got it under control. While the heat wave is significant, officials say it won't be as extreme as the deadly heat dome in 2021. Despite that, advocates are calling on cities to create maximum indoor temperature rules, particularly for renters. We know that the law uh, protects tenants from extreme cold, and that needs to be extended to high temperatures. To help those considered high risk, the province is handing out 8,000 and free air conditioners, but since the program started in June, fewer than 400 have been distributed. Melanie Nay, GCTV News, Vancouver. And we are seeing more horrific images tonight of the deadliest fire in the U.S. in more than a century. The devastation stark as some survivors return to their homes for the first time. The death toll has nearly reached 100, but the state's governor said the final number could far exceed that. CTV's Adrian Gobriel on a painful return and new details about a lawsuit. Oh my gosh, look at the harbor. Desolate and destroyed. Tragedy has taken up residence in Lahaina. If I don't make it through this, I love everybody. Built to keep the ocean at bay, this break wall shielded survivors from the hurricane fueled inferno. Some turned to the churning, choppy waters of the Pacific, while others, surrounded by flames, plunged into pools. Oh no, guys! No, we, we have to leave! Sadly, many are believed to have died in their vehicles as they tried to flee. I came so close to giving up. Gentlemen on my right and gentlemen on my left didn't survive. A landscape void of life is all that welcomes those coming to survey what they've lost. It's like we're the only things we have now because the reason that we had in the past is gone. Some haven't been as fortunate. Four members of Talfa Salmi Salmi's family didn't make it. Lost my uncle, Tony, and his wife, and his daughter. The number of missing remains in the hundreds. We want a confirmation that she's safe. So, what she, was the last you heard? She was at the senior center in Lahaina. Frustrated and homeless, many want to know why natural disaster sirens didn't sound to warn thousands of the fast approaching flames. We didn't just lose our homes, we lost our town, we lost history, you know. Our kids are traumatized. Two firefighters called to the scene say some hydrants had no water when they arrived. People getting stuck. Power lines were already down before the fire. FBI recovery teams are now on the ground to investigate the cause, though a class action lawsuit claims that collapsed energized power lines sparked the fire. I've personally authorized a comprehensive review, so we have every answer going forward. Hawaii's governor is warning that over the next two weeks, 10 to 20 bodies may be discovered each day as crews sift their way through the ash, street by street, home by home. Adrian Gobriel, CTV News, Toronto. Scientists are still analyzing the link between wildfires and climate change, but one effect appears to be extremely dry conditions, making it easier for fires to break out faster, more intensely, and last longer. The Premier of Alberta, whose own province has been ravaged by fierce flames this season, played down that connection in an interview with CTV News Today, instead focusing on the clash with Ottawa over new draft regulations on generating environmentally friendly electricity. Premier Smith, thanks so much for joining us. You've been very vocal about your opposition to these new regulations, even going so far as calling them unconstitutional. If you feel so strongly, why not immediately invoke the Sovereignty Act, which your government passed, and take the federal government to court? Well, look, I've been trying to work with the federal government to align their aspirations with what we think is realistic. We put forward uh, our emissions reduction and energy development plan, which talks about being carbon neutral by 2050. When I talk to everybody in the electricity business, they think that that's achievable. But trying to achieve these targets by 2035, I'm hearing numbers in the order of 200 to 400 billion dollars that it would cost us here. And it doesn't address our issues of reliability. So we have to have to operate in the real world. And in the real world, we need to a realistic plan. That's what I want to work with the federal government on. Now, the federal government says the 2035 timeline is realistic, and you are saying that's too soon, insisting on a 2050 timeline. You use the word diplomacy in your news conference today, and sometimes that involves compromise. Is there a date between 2035 and 2050 you'd be open to? And if so, what is it? 
Well, the first thing I would say is that we have to ask the, the generators. There's going to be the ones who have to imp implement it on the ground. And there are some, like Capital Power, that has been very open that they think they can achieve that target by 2045. There's approval processes that take place. There's a making sure the technology works. There's a regulatory approval process. There's the actual construction time. And that's why we think 2050 is the more realistic target. We can get there. You just a few minutes ago mentioned 2045. If the feds came back with that date, would your province sign on? Well, I want to make sure that that's only one company that I had mentioned. We have uh, several big power players in our province, and, and I want to make sure that we are in alignment with all of them. We are having this discussion, of course, at a time when there are critical conversations around the world on climate change. Much of the country, including your province, has been ravaged by wildfires this season. Do you believe there is a connection to climate change? Well, look, everybody is on target on 2050. That was decided a couple of years ago at COP26. And so all of the industrialized provinces are moving in that direction for exactly that reason. Everybody knows that we need to, to reduce emissions. But I'm also watching that China is um, a, a billion plus population. They don't have a target until 2060. India, as I understand it, doesn't have a target until 2070. But in terms of a link, Premier, do you believe that climate change and the unprecedented wildfires we've been seeing this summer are at all related? All, all I know is in my province, um, we had 650 fires and 500 of them were human caused. So we have to make sure that when people know that when it's dry out there and we get into forest fire season, that they're being a lot more careful because anytime you end up with an ignition that happens, it can have devastating consequences. And so that's uh, what I would hope that we can, we can educate the public on that front as well. All right, Premier Smith, thank you. Appreciate your time. My pleasure. Talk to you again. And you can see the full interview with Alberta Premier Danielle Smith on our website at ctvnews.ca. More than 50 people are dead in India's Himalayan region after days of heavy monsoons triggered landslides. The downpour washed away vehicles, demolished homes and businesses and flooded roads. The hardest hit areas saw as much as 419 millimeters of rain in 24 hours. Crews are working to save those who are trapped, but officials warn the death toll is expected to rise. A Malaysian flight was forced to turn back after a passenger on board allegedly made threats to blow up the plane midair. But he was wearing something on his hand. Whenever he was talking to the crew, he was like, I'm not afraid of dying. An hour after takeoff from Sydney to Kuala Lumpur, a passenger became disruptive, getting up, pushing passengers and making threats to the crew. Details of the outburst aren't confirmed, but reports say the 45-year-old unzipped his backpack, claiming to contain dangerous explosives, but authorities weren't able to find any. He was arrested once the plane landed. A grand jury in Atlanta delivered an indictment late tonight in the investigation on whether Donald Trump and some members of his inner circle tried to overturn the 2020 election results in that state. The Georgia inquiry is in addition to the legal troubles the former president is also facing in three other cases. CTV's Washington Bureau Chief Joy Malbin on today's proceedings. Security's been stepped up and streets closed around the Atlantic courthouse, concerned about potential protests should Donald Trump be indicted again. He lost this state and he continues to say he didn't lose it. And it's just creating a lot of tension and a lot of chaos. A grand jury is hearing evidence about the former president's alleged attempts to overturn the Georgia election results, including that explosive phone call, where Trump has heard pressuring election officials to find more votes to win the state. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes. The jury shown text messages and emails connecting the former president's advisors to a breach of voting software. More than a dozen people told they could face criminal charges. And legal experts say that could include racketeering, a powerful tool used against the mafia and organized crime. We don't take plea deals because I did nothing wrong. Land of the year. Lashing out in a campaign ad, Trump tried to get the district attorney, Fonnie Willis, disqualified. Welcome to the fraud squad. And even attacked a key witness on social media, saying, I'm reading reports that failed former Lieutenant Governor of Georgia, Jeff Duncan, will be testifying before the Fulton County Grand Jury. He shouldn't. 
Jeff Duncan wouldn't say if he felt intimidated. I'm going to answer the questions. And, you know, this is an important part of the healing process for the Republican Party. This is painful. Uh, this may feel ugly to some. And for the first time, a Trump trial could be broadcast to the world. Georgia law allows cameras in the court. Omar? All right, Joy, thank you. Coming up, deepening concerns about a popular prescription drug. I started having a lot of gastric problems. Ozempic side effects under scrutiny. Plus, the blindside bombshell. The football player who inspired a movie now claims he was conned. If spiders make you squeamish, you may want to cover your eyes for this next story. Border agents at the Edmonton International Airport have rescued two live tarantulas hidden in the mail. One spider was found inside a plastic container, the other in a toy plane. So the poor little thing was all squished up like this. It couldn't even move. And then when I un slowly unrolled it and all of a sudden, bing, his little legs stuck out. The tarantulas now have a new home at the Royal Alberta Museum. We are hearing tonight from patients who used to use the drug Ozempic, but say the side effects were so severe they destroyed their lives. The diabetes medication has often been touted for its weight loss benefits. As CTV's Genevieve Beauchemin reports, in some cases, however, there have been serious drawbacks. Oh. 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 With its catchy jingle, online stories of weight loss and celebrity gossip, Ozempic made headlines. But the diabetes drug is under the microscope, with an increasing number of patients claiming a rare diagnosis, gastroparesis, commonly known as stomach paralysis, could be a side effect. I was vomiting up to 200 times a week. Emily Wright was prescribed Ozempic to control her diabetes and weight. She lost 80 pounds in a year, but says she was repeatedly hospitalized and forced to take a leave of absence from her job as a teacher. Wright was told she suffers from gastroparesis, a disorder that stops the movement of food from the stomach to the small intestine. I'm still young. I want to keep up with my grandchildren. Jenna Norman is also battling diabetes and weight gain. She took herself off the drug. I started having a lot of gastric problems. I was taking off from work quite often. In the U.S., the makers of the drug face a lawsuit. A Louisiana woman says she lost 150 pounds, but claims manufacturers failed to adequately warn about the risks of gastroparesis. Anesthesiologists in the U.S. and Canada also now say Ozempic and similar drugs should be stopped at least three weeks prior to surgery, warning of potential life-threatening complications for those who need empty stomachs for sedation. The manufacturer says this class of medication has been extensively examined for years in robust clinical programs and that the majority of side effects are mild to moderate and adds that the drug is known to cause a delay in gastric emptying as noted in the product monograph. This class of medication and the formulation Ozempic or semaglutide has some very, very important benefits. But like all me medications, there are also some risks. Wright says she's speaking out so others know there's no magic pill. Today, at 130 pounds, I miss being the happy 280-pound woman that I once was. Wright says she has no data to prove Ozempic caused her stomach paralysis, and the manufacturer points out obesity and diabetes are risk factors for gastroparesis. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. Still ahead, an alarming event at the air show. A narrow escape before a vintage plane crashes. The NFL star whose life inspired the movie The Blind Side is suing the family who said they adopted him. Michael Orr says Sean and Leanne Tui tricked him into signing papers making them his conservators rather than his adoptive parents when he was 18. Michael, do you remember when we first met and we went to that horrible part of town to buy you those dreadful clothes? He says the family made millions off the movie which starred Sandra Bullock but didn't share it. After finding out earlier this year he wasn't adopted, he wants the conservatorship terminated. A lawyer for the TUI says they will defend themselves in court. There is new information tonight about the air show crash in Michigan yesterday. The pilot told investigators his Cold War era plane started losing power during flight. 
The Soviet fighter jet was about 50 kilometers west of Detroit when the pilot and a second person on board ejected. Both suffered non-life-threatening injuries. Investigators say the plane skidded 150 meters and went through some trees before stopping beside an apartment building. Sad news to pass along from the hockey world. Toronto Maple Leafs 2020 first-round draft pick Rodion Amarov has died at the age of 21. Amarov was selected 15th overall and was the first Russian to ever be drafted by the Leafs in the first round. In February of last year, the team announced Amarov had been diagnosed with a brain tumor. He had been undergoing treatment and hadn't played since the diagnosis. After the break, the triumph of a world title. The Canadian who pushed to become the fittest man on the planet. Four years ago, when Jeffrey Adler first took part in the CrossFit Games, he placed 33rd. Now the gym owner for Montreal has been crowned the fittest man on earth in the international competition, featuring a dozen grueling tests of strength and endurance. CTV's Vanessa Lee on the secret to his power. After his extraordinary feat, Jeffrey Adler is recovering and getting used to his new title. To be called like the fittest man on earth is like, there's no one else that beat you this year. Like in that moment, this is your first. There's nobody better. It's like it's it's a it's huge honor, honestly. Over the course of four days, Adler tackled grueling tests of strength, speed, and endurance at the CrossFit Games, which included lifting 360 pounds. Yeah! Inspired to get to the top since he first volunteered at the competition seven years ago, now part of Games history. There is something at uh, being the best at something. Like every year, it was just, just a little bit better. I was like, well, how much better can I get now? And then we got a little bit, a little bit better. And it's like, ooh, we can do a little bit more. I know we can do a little bit more. Among those helping him push his limits, his coach, Caroline Lambre, who also happens to be his fiance. I think she believed in me way before I did in myself. Definitely. <laughs> I think I, I'm the dreamer of the two. I tend to go big or go home. So as we were doing better and better, it was like, well, we might as well, like, I want to go for the big stage. Lambre, too, is cementing her name in history as the first female coach to win the games. She hopes to see more women in the mix. Good is good, right? Great is great. Doesn't matter where it's coming from, male or female. Anybody that puts in the work um, can do it. For now, it's time for a well-deserved vacation before another round of training begins to stay at the top of their game. Vanessa Lee, CTV News, Montreal. And after seeing that, I'll be doubling tomorrow morning's workout. That's a snapshot of this Monday for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching. Good night and see you tomorrow. National News, Canada's number one newscast.